Welcome to Return to the Heart, a course on St. Augustine's Confessions. My name is Dr. Shane Owens, a professor at Franciscan Missionaries of Our Lady University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And it's like my great pleasure with you to help you uh, walk through the sometimes uh, difficult or uh, intimidating work that is St. Augustine's Confessions. You may have started the book and, and felt discouraged partway through. You may have never read the book, always wanted to, and never had the time. But I hope in this course, I'll help you to appreciate, in particular, the spiritual vision that Augustine gives us in the Confessions. And, and that we'll come to that name of the course, Return to the Heart, to really think about what we're doing, what are we after, and, and how does Augustine's Confessions give us a kind of guide for what it means to return to our own heart, but more especially to return to the sacred heart of Jesus, who reveals to us what it means to be human. And, and in that, we can truly not only grow in knowledge, but grow in love of the Lord, love of ourselves, and love of neighbor. We, when we think of the human person, we often, I think, if we have any familiarity with Christian theology, we more often not think of something like the image of God, the Imago Dei, which we get from Genesis, that man and woman are created in the image and God, likeness of God. Right? And I think when I think of image, at least three things occur to me. First is that an image is meant to be seen. Right? It doesn't do me a lot of good if I have a portrait of my wife and I on our wedding day and I put it in the master bedroom closet. No one can see it. Right? So we make an image such that it can be seen. Second, an image is an image of something. Right? It, it is an image because it depicts something else. And third, an image has to be created. It's made. Right? We can recognize the difference between a photo and my wife and I on our actual wedding day. It's not the reality itself, but an image of it. What does this tell us about the human person? How does this help us to understand what it means to be a human being in light of Christian theology and the revelation of the Bible? First, that we were created to be seen. And this is something I think Augustine comes to deeply appreciate in, the, uh, in his confessions, right? Is that God created us and he sees us and he knows us. And the main actor in the confessions, the protagonist of the story is not Augustine, but God himself. God acting in Augustine's life, directing his life, directing the lives of his friends to bring Augustine back to him, right? So he's seen. And the more Augustine recognizes himself as seen, the more he feels God's love, the more he deepens in his self-knowledge then we come to understand ourselves um, in the light of God. Second, we talked about that an image is of something else, right? So we are in the image and likeness of God because we're in the image of God. So there's something about us that's like God. Now, of course, God doesn't have a body. He can't sit in a chair like I do. As much as he may do this in certain depictions of art or murals or stained glass windows, God does not have a body. He doesn't have a beard, right? He, he's... Uh, doesn't have anything like that. So if we're like God in the image, then it means we're like God in our soul, right? We're not like God in our body, we're like God in our soul. And that means that in our knowing, and our loving, and remembering, we come to be like the triune God. Lastly, we talked about an image being created, right? An image is given to us. I think this is tremendously important because in our image-based and image-obsessed culture today, if we think of something like social media, and social media platforms are multiplying by the day, you can barely keep track of the number of social media platforms. When your smartphone buzzes or vibrates, you don't even know which social media platform you should be checking, right? We might think of image as something that's, that's catered or cultivated or created or formed. It's something in my own hands. It's something in my own doing. It's something that I'm bringing about. But what Christian theology reminds us is that image is not something we make. And there's something exhausting about that process, right? One of the things that sociological studies and psychological studies keep telling us is people are lonelier than they've ever been. They're more anxious than they've ever been. They're more depressed than they've ever been. And that's with a seeming plethora of options of connecting with the other 8 billion people on earth. But it's because we don't really feel seen in social media because we're constructing something that's not really ourselves. But Augustine wants to recognize that in the Christian truth and our understanding that we have from Scripture and from the Church of Tradition, we don't make ourselves. God makes us. And there's actually a tremendous freedom in that. And that's a freedom that Adam and Eve rejected, right? One of the things we see is that Adam and Eve were created in the image and likeness of God. But what does Satan tempt them with in the garden? Satan says, eat of this tree, Eve, right? Eat of the fruit of this tree and you will become like God. Why would this be a temptation at all? Adam and Eve, we already learned in Genesis 1, are like God. How could Satan tempt them? You could say Adam and Eve wanted to be like God without God. They didn't want to be dependent on the gift or the creatureliness they've received in God. They wanted to be, be like God. They wanted to be in charge of themselves. They wanted to forge their own image and their own way. And we see that playing out in our society in so many different ways and questions of, of 
of euthanasia or gender or sexuality where people want to create their own image. So we have these reflections on the human person, but what's important to note is that when we talk about image in the Christian theological tradition, we have not even exhausted what it means to be a human person. Because I said when we are in the image and likeness of God, that only is speaking about our soul. It doesn't even take us to the question of our body. And the human person is a soul-body composite. We call this hylomorphism. And so there has to be something more of what it means to be human. Augustine tells us in his Confessions, and this is in Book 10, quote, My heart, it is only there that I am whoever I am. My heart, it is only there that I am whoever I am. So it's to the heart rather than image that we come to truly understand what it means to be human. Image captures what it means to be like God, but that doesn't ex exhaust the mystery of what it means to be human. A heart is the center of the human person. Or even the fact that the, in the scriptures, as well as in Augustine's theology, that he chooses the heart, the heart is a central organ in the human person, right? It's, it's that which pumps uh, blood through the whole body. It's the center of the circulatory system, right? So the heart captures for us, for Augustine and for the biblical sensibility, right? the dwelling place of the self, where we are most ourselves, where we are most who we are. And it's also, it's, it captures many of the notions of mind, of thinking and loving, but it also captures the emotions. God, the angels, they don't have emotions. God and the angels don't have emotions because they don't have a body. Emotions are part of bodiliness, right? So we have emotions, and so the heart captures that emotions. It's not just the emotions, right? Sometimes you'll hear people say something like, a journey from the head to the heart, or like, oh, well, he felt it in his heart, but he didn't know it in his head. Augustine wouldn't want to juxtapose things so strongly, would say, right? Because the heart isn't just about feeling. It's not just about emotions, right? But the heart speaks to our deepest self. It involves thinking. And in fact, it's actually the Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraph 2563, 2563 in the Catechism, gives us this lovely definition that is both biblical and Augustinian for the heart. The heart is the dwelling place where I am, where I live. According to the Semitic or biblical expression, the heart is the place to which I withdraw. The heart is our hidden center, beyond the grasp of our reason of others. Only the Spirit of God can fathom the human heart and know it fully. The heart is a place of decision, deeper than our psychic drives. It is the place of truth, where we choose life or death. It is a place of encounter, because as an image of God, we live in relation. It is a place of covenant. A beautiful definition for the Catechism. It gets us to the heart of what it means to have a human heart. Now we can move to the Confessions. Why well, care about the Confessions? Why well, care about St. Augustine? Who is St. Augustine, right? We may be familiar with him. In many ways, St. Augustine is the paradigmatic convert. With St. Paul on one hand and St. Augustine on the other, we have the model of conversion in the Christian life. St. Augustine was born on November 13th in 354 in a town of Tagost in North Africa, what was then a Roman province. He was born to his father, Patricius, we could say Patrick, and his mother, Monica, herself a saint. Patrick was no saint at the time, a pagan Roman. You could say they were a respectable Roman class, maybe what we would think of as something as kind of upper middle class. Um, but they were strained sometimes financially. They invested very heavily in Augustine's education, giving him the best education they could at the time. And Augustine succeeded. He excelled in his education. He was a brilliant intellect, uh, an affable spirit. People naturally were friends with Augustine his whole life. And he would rise to the very heights of his career. He would become the chief rhetorician for the emperor in Milan, which is the place, the, the seat of the imperial capital at the time. It's there in Milan that he meets St. Ambrose, and guided by St. Ambrose, inspired by his study of scripture and of philosophy. He leaves the Manichaeans, a sect we'll learn a lot more about later in this course, and he's baptized a Catholic. He'll return to Africa, where he wanted to live and study and leisure and relaxation with his friends. He'll be ordained a priest instead, and later consecrated a bishop. He'll serve as a bishop for 35 years in Hippo Regius, a small um, coastal town there in North Africa. Augustine has given us more than 5.4 million words. An unbelievable um, standard. We actually, in fact, have many of those here sitting next to me in this room, those 5.4 million words. But none are perhaps more famous to us as moderns than the Confessions. But his words have become the foundation of all of Western Christian medieval thought. Figures like St. Bonaventure, St. Augustine, Alexander of Hales, Albert the Great, Peter Lombard, you name the medieval, Abelard, Bernard of Clairvaux, would frequently be found to say something like, Dicit Augustinus. It was said by Augustine, and then quoting Augustine, he was the preeminent, after the Bible, authority of medieval thought. But as much as he is precise in his philosophical and theological reason, he was more prized, I'd say, for his deep spiritual 
and psychological insight and what it meant to be a human person and to study the human person's straying from God and returning to God. And it's for this we value the confessions so deeply. A few prefatory remarks when we think about the confessions and what it means to read them. First is, you'll hear when I talk about the confessions that we're going to speak of books, right? Now, when people hear books, they might hear, oh, the confessions is 13 books. We shouldn't imagine 13 volumes on a bookcase, right? That's not the kind of book. Instead, let's think about books of the Bible, like when we talk about the book of Genesis or the book of Psalms. So maybe like chapters, but like we said, biblical books, so we have these 13 books. The second is a matter of translation. There are numerous translations of the confessions, many quite impressive. Maybe the most famous and most familiar to many Christians would be that of the great apologist Frank Sheed. There's also the famous translation of the Oxford Don Henry Chadwick. I'll instead, in this case, in this course, be referring to the translation of the, Benis, bit, of the late British Benedictine sister, Maria Bolding. Bolding's command of Augustine's Latin and the richness and vivacity of her English uniquely capture Augustine's prose in a lucid and lyrical voice, and so we will treasure hers. And many times we'll actually see that I think her translation gets to truths that might be lost in other translations. And the other thing to note is when we have Bible passages in your reading of the confessions, they may seem a little different, and they may not look exactly like the versions of these quotes that you would have in your own Bibles, and that's because in the confessions, Augustine is using what is known as the Vetus Latina, or the Old Latin, which is a North African translation of the Bible, of the Greek Old Testament and the Greek New Testament into Latin, and this predated St. Jerome's Latin Vulgate, which would become the default Latin translation of the later church history and remains the official translation of the church today. What is the Confessions? What is this work? The St. Augustine's Confessions is often described as maybe the first autobiography of the West, or the first introspective autobiography. Although, if we pick up the Confessions and we start reading it, it seems clear to me that the Confessions is not like most other autobiographies we could ever encounter. One, it seems very uneven in its treatment, right? You might expect an autobiography to, to really cover most of a person's life. Give us some sense of where they were born, what their family was like, um, events of their childhood, right? We expect details and dates and places and names. And there are a few uh, references to his age and a few places at least when he moves city. But Augustus' Confessions is not an autobiography in any way like this, like many that you would find in your uh, used bookstore today on any famous figure. It's not an autobiography in that way. His selection of events is punctuated and surprising. He infrequently um, will focus uh, in great detail on events, sometimes just moving through them quickly and generally. The sin he spends the most time talking about is a teenage theft of pears. Not exactly for someone who we expect to have uh, reflections. Right? He's the great famous sinner turned saint. We might expect him to give us all kind of, my students want, scintillating details or an expose of the kind of things he did. And as much as he admits to being proud in his rhetoric and proud about his intellect and, and, and deceitful in his friendships, lustful in his common law marriage to his unnamed common law wife, as much as he points to all these things, that's not the sin he focuses on. He focuses on this one sin of a pair as a teenage boy. His baptism is narrated just in passing. The climax of his entire conversion is told in merely a sentence. Perhaps the way the Confessions most surprises us with as an autobiography is its mode of address. Most often when we think of an autobiography, we think we're going to get a lot of first person. I did this, I did that, right? And there is certainly first person in the Confessions, but the whole of the Confessions is really framed in the second person. There's a lot of uh, you pronouns. It's a dialogue with God. The Confessions is aptly described as prayer overheard. Augustine is speaking to God. He's praying with God. Now, Augustine is not writing the Confessions for God. God already knows everything. Augustine says even if he was to close his heart off from God, he would still, God would still know. But he confesses to God. He prays before God because he has to do so for himself. One, because he knows that it's in praising God that his heart finds rest in God. But also because he knows that it redounds to God's glory and it's it's what other souls need. It's what other people need. They need to know how God has acted in Augustine's life. Because if other people could see how God has acted in Augustine's life, if they can see how God's mercies are so vast, and they have taken Augustine from such a deep place of sin to this powerful place of service in God's vineyard, then they too can expect God to work like this in their life. And Augustine wants other people to come to confess God as he did. 
So when we think of the word confessions, we shouldn't primarily think of the idea of confessing sins, as Catholics do in the sacrament that we would call penance, reconciliation, or confession. He you know, undoubtedly mentions his sins, and he confesses his sins before God, right? He does have a kind of personal examine of his sin, but as I said, it's not a scintillating expose. He does not want us to find his sins attractive. Sin is always presented as disintegrating, imprisoning, or starving Augustine's. It's not really about sin as much as it is God's mercy for our sins and the way that God brings us back to him so that we can return to ourselves and return to our hearts. And thus, we can thank and confess his name.